everyone. We're now live. We're so excited that you joined us for a very relevant topic of conversation, which is human trafficking. This is Casa de la Familia, a virtual call with Dr. Ana Nogales and uh, five other esteemed panelists. We were very excited to partner with because we know that partnership is at the core of what we do and especially now under this COVID-19. Um, our campaign uh, right to rise really kind of reflects how we want to empower people coming out of this situation and becoming survivors and thrivers ultimately. So welcome all of you. Thank you for registering and we will be, um, first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about CASA, but mainly wait to the very end also to give you some highlights and points of what we're doing in the way of human trafficking as an organization. Well, Casa de la Familia, as many of you know, um, we are a nonprofit organization and we are dedicated to helping victims of crime. And in this we're having the conversation on human trafficking. I am their outreach director. I know many of you, so I can't see you, but I wish I could. So hello to everyone. Um, I want to tell you something a little bit about Dr. Ana Nogales. She will be the host today going forward and introducing each of the conversation continues. Uh, Dr. Ana Nogales is a clinical psychologist. She is the founder of Nogales Psychological Company and Casa de la Familia, where she established this in 1996-97 for victims of trauma. She oversees a clinical staff of 40 bicultural, bilingual mental health professionals and an, an outreach program of domestic violence and sexual assault services in Los Angeles, as well as Orange County and beyond. Dr. Nogales was recently appointed as the Woman Graduates USC Violence Against Women Working Group Chair, and WG USA is the USA affiliate of Graduate Women International, which many of you have heard of, the leading girls and women's global organization run by and for women advocating for women's rights quality and empowerment through the access uh, to quality education and training. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nogales. And as I said, we welcome you. We thank you. Thank you so much for coming together. And Dr. Nogales, we'd love to hear from you. I'll take I'll leave you now. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, we're here today about talking about human trafficking. The pandemic is devastating the global economy and sex trafficking is affected in more than one way too. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, lockdowns, travel restrictions, research cutbacks, and other measures to curb the spread of the new coronavirus are putting victims of human trafficking at risk of further exploitation, while organized crime networks profit from the pandemic. We can see that uh, there are other uh, sectors uh, like street bears, escorts, porn performers that are now experiencing financial hardships and they become victims of vulnerable to sexual exploitation too. We know that there are residential brothels and illicit massage parlors that are still operating business. There's also a spike in people trying to access illegal websites featuring child pornography. Traffickers may become more active and prey on people who are even more vulnerable than before because they have lost their jobs. There are fewer options for them now. It's work the streets or starve. This is just one more, one more of those that have to do these life, life and death decisions on every day. Many started to work remotely as an alternative option, but this is not easy for some because it requires to have the adequate equipment and to build up a clientele. So they need to go and search for traffickers uh, to help their business. Some have been coerced by sex traffickers, while others it's a life of choice, but not really, because in most of those cases, this supposedly life of choice is because of discrimination, poverty, and they need to provide for their families. Many have been coerced into uh, sexual exploitation. Many street sex workers, like high school diplomas, are undocumented, have extensive criminal records, and are victims of abuse. Those people, it's hard for them to find a job even in normal, in normal days. So now traffickers are exploiting them. They are becoming much more vulnerable uh, to exploitation. 
more workers have returned to the abusive exploitative managers, if they can be called managers, to survive um, and because they don't have an income adequate for their needs and they are taking now riskier behaviors than any time in the past. Uh, and as they are being exploited, um, people are asking for even more things and pay less because there is less demand because of the pandemic. So they are a riskier behavior than ever, ever in the past. Now let's talk about children. Children are in danger of new forms of abuse, such as drive-through services. Many more children are being forced into the streets because they need food, they need money, and they are at risk of, of exploitation. Now about Jones, the Jones who continue to solicit service amid the pandemic have taken advantage of the situation, demanding to pay less and ask for more. With COVID-19, victims are at higher risk because of uh, the restricting movement diverting law enforcement resources and reducing social and public services. So this is what we are seeing nowadays at the time of the pandemic and about sexual exploitation. I want to talk about what is happening here in Southern California, in Los Angeles and Orange counties. And here we have a wonderful set of presenters that can talk about that really good. So I'm gonna introduce our first presenter. This is Rosangela Rodriguez Watkins. She's a licensed clinical social worker who is a clinical supervisor at CAS and manage, manages the case management and internship programs. She has 10 years of experience in mental health and clinical case management. She has worked at the residential and outpatient behavioral health facilities and clinics. She has worked with survivors of gender-based violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, state-sponsored torture, domestic violence, and child abuse. She has trained medical providers, attorneys, law enforcement, hotline research, response worker, workers, mental health providers, and other social services providers on human trafficking. She also does presentations on CAST empowerment models to lead delegations from different parts of the world. So welcome, Rosangela. What a background. Can you tell us what is going on in Los Angeles according to what CAST is seeing and what do you see happening? Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Nogales, for inviting me. And um, we are huge supporters of Casa de la Familia and a lot of our clients that uh, have services through your organization speak very highly of the organization and, and their, um, their mental health providers. Um, so as far as what we're seeing right now, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I think when there's a time of crisis, people usually assume that there's going to be an increase in calls or an increase in, in accessing services. And unfortunately, we've seen the opposite. We actually have seen a decrease in, in our hotline calls. And, and that could be, um, you know, for various reasons, but it almost reminds me of um, the last election and sort of the response um, with uh, anti, the anti-immigration sentiment and how some traffickers were using that as a way to to um, threaten uh, the survivors of trying to access help or resources. So it could be something similar to that where individuals um, are seeing what's in the media, are seeing um, what, uh, you know, th the news and, and hearing um, the, the risk, the, the health risks and, and safety risks that are occurring and are fearful of asking for help or are being more, I guess, if that's even a, I don't know how you can be more isolated, but more of a, a sense of isolation, um, being, having to be at home because we have to. And so um, uh, we have seen a decrease, but we also have seen with our current caseload, um, clients where we were ready to graduate from our case management program um, are now um, wanting to stay in our program because of the crises that uh, the, the, because COVID is, you know, obviously leading to people losing their housing, losing their jobs. And so now people are, are dealing with all these new issues that um, they were not ready to, I guess, um, address or deal with or have the resources right now. So even though we have um, a decrease, we do, our, our, we are more busy than ever. Our case managers are more busy than ever. Our shelters are more busy than ever um, because our, our clients are really needing 
more more support and more resources at this time. That's also true for domestic violence. That's also true for domestic violence that we have less amount of, of cases uh, being called for emergency. I, I guess that Gabriel is taking all of these calls. I, I don't know what is happening there. So uh, um, we're seeing less people calling for um, uh, um, services, for emergency services, but we do know that behind the scenes, there is a, an increase, a high increase of uh, domestic violence worldwide, anywhere. In, so we're gonna see much more of the numbers as soon as we are done with the pandemic, with the lockdown, with the quarantine. So we'll see much more. So I'm gonna change a little bit of the agenda and I'm gonna ask uh, Detective Gallegos to tell us what is going on because you are with LAPD, right? Can you tell us what kind of work you are doing and what is it that you are doing and what is happening from your end? Detective Gallegos, are you there? Uh, are you mute? I guess, I guess Gabriela is a little bit distracted now. I think he may have had to step away briefly, but perhaps. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to okay. say. I believe Wendy might have something to say on on certain issues that you brought up, Doctor. Well, I was waiting for Wendy later on, so I'm going to go then to Orange County because I want to tell Wendy what resources she can uh, provide later on. So okay. I'm going to go to. Um, uh, uh, let's see, Stephanie. Stephanie Taylor. Thank you for being here with us and welcome. Stephanie is the program coordinator of the Salvation Army Anti-Trafficking Services Program in Orange County. She serves as part of the core leadership team for the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force. She works with the United States Department of State International Visitors Delegation, providing trainings on current best practices in Orange County, addressing human trafficking to delegates from countries around the world. She supervises a team of case managers and graduate level interns, provides trainings and mobilizes faith-based communities and key stakeholders on how they can fight human trafficking. She works as an adjunct professor at Bangor University with Sandy Morgan is too, teaching the importance of holistic aftercare services to human trafficking victim survivors. And at Sousa Pacific University, teaching on human rights on sustainable development that's where she graduated from. So, and she also working, spent some time in Cambodia working with international organizations. So you have a broad experiences on human trafficking. So Stephanie, what is going on in Orange County? What can you tell us about uh, what is happening there? Do you have the same experiences as what just uh, we heard from Los Angeles? Um, we're getting a lot of calls regarding sex trafficking victims needing emergency placement because so many of us have um, had to stop intakes. We had to stop intakes right around the time of, of COVID kind of being announced and the shelter at home uh, mandate was placed um, because, I mean, two months ago, we knew so little about what was going on. I feel like we don't really know much more of what's going on with COVID and how it's affecting us, but we're learning day to day. And I think a lot of us kind of just um, made that decision to reduce outbreak or was to stop intakes on our housing. So. Um, you know, we serve both for national um, victims of trafficking and domestic victims of trafficking. We have what we call our guest house, which is three um, townhomes serving the four national population of sex trafficking and some labor trafficking. And then we have Tatiana's home, which is our domestic um, home for emergency shelter. So, you know, we've been able to keep some of our homes going um, based on the census that was already in the home, you know, like we didn't, we weren't going to take the survivors out of the home. So we've We've had to play, place some very specific restrictions and really encourage them and shift the way we serve, we serve them. Um, we did have to put a pause on Tatiana's home because the census was low, so we were able to work with partner agencies to house the one client we did have. Um, so what I've noticed in, we get calls for new clients and we have to let them know the pause on intake, um, but what I've noticed too is a lot of our previous clients are now reaching out because we know our survivors move on to next step, whether it's next housing or um, more and more independent, but they still remain vulnerable, um, especially with job loss and lack of access to resources. So I have found a shift in our services going to our already graduated clients and working with them and kind of accessing food banks, um, getting on unemployment, 
um, you know, medical services and anything that they might need. Um, so it's been interesting to watch the shift in services while we can't provide housing up front at the moment. Um, being able to help them remotely has been has been has been a good shift for our program. And uh, there are uh, access available to shelters, right? I'm sorry. There is access. Uh, there is availability of shelters. We do have shelters to provide for victims, right? We do. It just depends on which shelters are doing intakes right now. Because what we're trying to do is reduce the risk of outbreak in the shelter. And so, like our our foreign our shelter for our foreign nationals are almost at capacity, but they were already placed at the shelter. And so we haven't taken any new um, individuals into into shelters because we have one, um, an immunocompromised um, individual in one of our shelters that we can't risk him getting sick. And then we also have um, an individual, one of our survivors had a baby at the end of April. So then there's that a fear of, you know, bringing in somebody else that hasn't been tested. So we've been working with a lot of agencies um, in Orange County, seeing who's doing testing for free. And we've started conversations with them because this is such an unprecedented um, situation. We've been having conversations with them about, you know, asking, can we get testing done without symptoms to individuals that we would want to bring into the shelter so that at least we can have a positive, I mean, a negative test when they come into the shelter. Um, but it's, it's been hard because we, we know the, the crisis there has been with, with testing. So it's been a conversation that we've been having and hoping that maybe we can make that part of our protocol prior to them coming into the shelter. Right. So it's interesting times because on one side you want to help and there, there are so many restrictions going on. Yeah. And, you know, there's this, the, the projection from, you know, epidemiologists, the experts at the top, they're saying, we're hearing a lot about there being a potential resurgence in the fall and winter. And, you know, whether that's going to happen or not, we do need to prepare for it. And we can't, you know, we, we, we don't want to do what we did, you know, what we have had, have had to do by shutting down intakes. You know, we want to be able to figure out a way to maneuver through this and do business as usual as most as we as best as we can. So that's the strategy we're talking about. That's why we're having conversations with with different agencies in the county and seeing if we can do the test prior to them coming into the shelter. Um, Salvation Army has a lot of resources and so um, we have FEMA trailers set up at some of our emergency homeless shelters that we're able to use if one of our, our survivors gets get sick and there's, you know, and they need to quarantine, we can put them in a FEMA trailer. So we have some ideas and strategies in place. It's just kind of figuring out figuring out what next steps are going to be as far as reopening shelters um, and and what that's going to look like because it's going to change the way we do intakes. It's going to change a lot of the way we do things. Right. Very different times. Mm -hmm. Detective Mario Gallegos, we're looking for you a minute ago. Can you tell us what is going on? You are, Can you introduce yourself first and tell us what kind of work you do about human trafficking and what's going on in LA County? Uh, yes, thank you. Sorry, I had to step out. I had a call. It's from. okay. Uh, supervisor. So um, I've been a detective for the last five years. I've been in the Los Angeles Police Department for about 20 years. Uh, most of my career has been in um, complex investigations, homicides, sexual assault, human trafficking. Um, I now am the officer in charge of the human trafficking unit out of downtown Los Angeles. And basically what that means is we have um, five to six investigators that our sole responsibility is um, the training for all of our officers, either within the city of LA or other agencies regarding human trafficking, all matters. Um, and then also our main responsibility is the investigation of all human trafficking cases involving minors specifically. Uh, we do handle cases with adults, um, but we tend to, uh, take the cases where we have, um, you know, violence, kidnapping, uh, movement from uh, in and out of the state of our victims for the adults. Uh, we do this in collaboration with uh, DCFS, who is a close partner of ours, and probation. Uh, we have very strong ties and great relationships with uh, Journey Out, um, Saving Innocence, Zoe International, just to name a few. Um, just to give you guys an, an, an understanding, um, we have six investigators, and in 2019, we responded 112 times um, off hours to active investigations, just to, to give you a, a snapshot. And we, we handle cases uh, citywide within the city of Los Angeles, 
Obviously, our cases take us all over the state. They take us sometimes all over the country. Also, we've gone far into the mid into the Mid East or you know the East Coast for our cases. So um, we kind of handle cases all over the country and the state. Um, we're one of the the great the best things that we're doing now is we have a partnership with probation and DCFS where we're involved in the first responders protocol. And I'm sure some of you are aware of that protocol, which is basically um, a multi-agency response to an active human trafficking investigation where um, officers will recover a child and immediately they're making notifications to DCFS through a hotline. And then DCFS is then making their notifications and you have multiple agencies that respond um, to the child's needs, whether it be for, um, you know, advocate services, medical services, um, social worker response via DCFS and investigators respond. And so it's kind of a, a, a multi-agency response to, to, uh, an investigation. So that's a, the best thing that we have going right here and that I can say in LA County. Um, I've been in investigations for the last 20 years and I've never seen, a program like this that um, really meets the needs of, of the child and the family and uh, also um, helps push that investigation forward at the same time. How is the pandemic affecting uh, issues of human trafficking nowadays? Or what do you see? Well, what we have seen is we have seen more activity on our, on our boulevards, uh, specifically on the Figueroa Corridor Boulevard. Um, our San Fernando um, Valley corridor, which is on Sepulveda, is somewhat quieter. So most of our commercial sex workers have moved from working or walking the boulevard to um, more of uh, motels where, you know, that's where the prostitution is being engaged. Um, on Figueroa corridor, the activity has, has, um, has remained the same and even increased. We have seen the our commercial sex worker population has actually grown from what I've from what I'm being told um, by vice officers, uh, patrol officers, um, and this is unfortunate. The just due to the pandemic, the city of Los Angeles, the, the police department has responded um, where we originally we would have undercover vice officers actively working those corridors um, trying to either go after the the Johns or go out or trying to identify and recover our victims or even um, identify or recover our suspects um, and unfortunately the vice units have have been given different missions as a result of this pandemic um, so that has effect that has affected us in in, in our enforcement abilities, really. And at this time, I can only speak for our unit, we're more in a reactive um, mode. I understand from uh, Detective Derek in Orange County that the, the uh, private brothels are very actively working now, right? Is that your experience too? Uh, I could only say that um, the intelligence that I have right now is is our motels are much more active motels um when it comes down to if we're speaking about massage parlors those places have been shut down within the city of los angeles you know i see uh well i want to thank you because it's a it's a great job that uh, you and your unit are doing um, it's a very risky job and i think that this time is a good time to say for people when they see something say something and instead of, do, instead of doing something, what they have to do is call 888-3737-888, which is the line where you can report anonymously any kind of activity. And then they will contact the, the police departments or the units that are specifically designed for human trafficking. Is that right, Detective? Yes. Anything specifically that you want to say about that for people to pay attention or to keep in mind? No, I mean, I can only reiterate, um, anytime, we always tell the public, anytime you see um, anything that doesn't seem right, um, you know, I think as a, as, a, as a social responsibility, we should be calling law enforcement um, and let the officers respond and, you know, decide or investigate. But 
as a society, we have a responsibility to call. Um, a lot of times people say, oh, I should have called. Um, and I'd hate to walk away having that feeling and not ha had the opportunity to do something or call somebody um, and, and not having done it. Um, a lot of our kids that we speak to, um, they tell us about making eye contact with, with witnesses or, or passerbys and sometimes in hopes that that eye contact would trigger that citizen to make a phone call. So that really speaks to me when um, a lot of our, of our victims are out there and um, they're attempting to, you know, reach out for help. And the only way they can is maybe making eye contact with somebody and giving them that distress look. And I really, uh, I really would like the, the citizens to know that if they see that or they get that feeling, they should always call and they can always be cleared up by law enforcement. Again, 888-3737-888, write it down, but if by any chance you don't have that number at, uh, at hand, 911 is the next number, right? Yes. Thank you so much, Detective Ayos, and thank you again for everything you are doing. Now, because of a question of time, I'm going to introduce to Wendy, Wendy Daly. She has been working uh, with human trafficking by creating an economy uh, 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 creating an economic empowerment for the victims. Victims to be able to have a life, uh, they need many things. The, first of all, they need to be, to be protected by law enforcement, of course, and we have heard Detective Gallegos, but they also need many other things. They need mental health, they need medical attention, but they need the power to have a life for themselves. So listen what Wendy Daly was doing. Uh, she has been creating an empowerment opportunity for survivors through the, her nonprofit International Sanctuary. Wendy believes that you can change the world through business, and her goal is to live in a world where women can live in true freedom. So, Wendy, why don't you tell us about what you are doing and what, what has been the impact of what you do in victims of human trafficking? I know you have to leave earlier, so I'm, I'm uh, anticipating your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me today. You know, it's such an honor to be um, in community with all of you. And I am so grateful for the partnerships um, that stretch, you know, not only in Orange County, but LA County and statewide. Um, we work globally in five regions and we know it is the collective effort of everyone's part. Um, that being from the participant, from the participant in the public, the citizen that calls the hotline, to um, the detective, just as we heard, um, to the shelters, as we've heard from um, Stephanie and Cast, and all the incredible advocacy um, and case management work that they're doing. So, so grateful for just all the partnerships because we could not do what we do um, without the support of others. We know the um, human traffickers are networked and so we have to be that much closer networked. Um, and I was so excited about the partnership that International Sanctuary was forming with Casa de la Familia um, right at the first week of March. Um, some of our women were able to receive mental health services from the professionals um, under CASA, and we were so grateful and, and look forward to continuing deepening that partnership moving forward. Um, so our effort and niche has really been to provide employment for survivors and livelihood. And what we have seen is in our um, safe healing workplace communities, which we call sanctuaries, um, there's a strength in the um, peer community that they build with each other. And so there's accountability and there's relationships, um, learning to trust other individuals. And so we've um, aimed to transfer that in the shutdown. It, it's been very challenging. Um, but to try to maintain that for um, all of our women. And some of them are living in shelters and some of them are living in shelters, um, obviously together. There's been a handful of uh, women that are living alone, which is very, very challenging during this time. Um, but again, they are receiving their um, paychecks and resources so that they have all the um, uh, essential needs that they, they need. 96% of our women have um, bank accounts, so they have their own um, control over their own money, which we know is such a vital part of the healing process for, um, for these women and for women in general, just to be able to have control over their, um, their own money. So, Wendy, I totally uh, understand this. We have so many victims that have 
gone back to the traffickers because they were not able to have a life by themselves because they don't have they didn't have the resources they they couldn't find a job they were exploited also uh, at, a jo at the jobs that they were able to find so i admire that you took it upon yourself to create this avenue to help women to have their own own ability to go back to work or do something with their life that would provide financial support uh, I, I received from you some numbers, but I would like you to tell yourself about your success, about the impact of what you are doing. Sure, sure. Yeah, we've worked with over 450 women since um, 2007, and we are, um, like I said, operating in five regions globally. So we started in Mumbai, India, and then opened our um, effort in Orange County as part of a partnership with the Human Trafficking Task Force. And then we're, we're going to be talking in a minute with yes. Dean Trump. And, um, then in uh, Tijuana, Mexico, as well as Uganda and the Philippines. So. In Tijuana, Mexico too. Well, uh, talking about Tijuana, Mexico, I know that the situation is very difficult because there are so many people vulnerable to be trafficked because they have to wait for months in order to receive a, an appointment to be able to seek asylum, political asylum or any kind of asylum. So they have to wait and now with the pandemic it's really even worse. So uh, people in Tijuana, according to the research that I did, uh, do not uh, do not report anything because well, the, the law enforcement don't have the facility, the, 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 the ability to prosecute and most of them are not prosecute, prosecuted and then therefore the victims that are reported at a much higher risk than if they do not report. So I know that there are, this is a very, very difficult time in Tijuana. Yeah. So what, whatever you're doing over there, I. I know it's very meaningful to them, very meaningful to give them an opportunity. So thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. Detective, do you, want, do you have any idea what is happening in, uh, in Tijuana, for example? No, no, no? I, I apologize. It's out of your have, jurisdiction, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit far. We, we you know, most of our cases are, uh, our victims are, are U.S. citizens or just kids from our communities. Uh, right. We have seen a small number of cases where, you know, we, we have a, an immigrant victim, um, but that's a very small percentage. Yeah, I took a special interest in that, and I went to Tijuana to check on shelters with another one of our therapists at Casa de la Familia, Claudia Diaz. We went together. We took the risk, not knowing that much where we're we were going. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it to do it, but it was an, in, a very interesting experience and I had the ability to interview many people, so I got a lot of information about what's going on. So very difficult, but well, thank you. Let me introduce now Lynn Tram. Uh, Lynn Tram has been the administrator for the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force since 2010, 10 years of experience already. The task force is co-chaired by the Anaheim Police Department and Waymakers, and also includes 10 additional lead agencies and 40 community partners mm -hmm. in Orange County to help address the goals and objectives related to human trafficking enforcement and prosecution, supporting victims and prevention. She also helps supervise Waymakers Human Trafficking Victim Services programs. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much for being with us. I know you have so much knowledge experience about dealing with these issues of human trafficking especially in Orange County and uh, we have been talking a little bit about what is going on in Los Angeles and Orange County I know that you have more information so tell us what is going on in Orange County. Um, thank you Dr. Nogales for um, inviting me here I'm going to do I have some quick points to make um, because as an administrator, I do get to see a little bit of what we're doing with the victim services, um, our enforcement team, as well as what's going on with our prosecution and the courts at this time. Um, it COVID-19 uh, has impacted um, the way we have done things, um, and we are still trying to get updates on what's going to happen when there is a re-entry back into work. Um, so what I can say from the from victim referrals coming in is that in March it was a very low victim referral number coming in. So maybe we had about three or four victim referrals, and that's actually very considered very low for us here in Orange County. When on average we have about I would say 14 per month for the past two years. Um, but that's that. That being said, we we could not assess at that time if that was going to be a continuation. Um, in April we had about 17 referrals coming in. 
Um, so we can say that in March, a guess was that because there was such a big transition in from going to work to immediately going working from home, that that transition period did affect referrals coming in. Um, however, the referrals that came in from April, it, what the biggest impact was that most of those referrals did not come from law enforcement. For us here in Orange County, the vast majority of referrals actually come from law enforcement and prosecutor referrals. Um, so those referrals were actually across the board and we saw more referrals coming from the National Human Trafficking Hotline in April. And we're still seeing a steady, uh, it's the same rate right now for May as well. Um, but for our law enforcement, uh, they they did say really early on, and especially in late March to April, that they were un, similar to what the detectives said that they were unable to be as proactive as they used to be. Um, and so we know that our victims don't really self-identify, so being reactive is also very difficult as well. Um, so until our law enforcement has increased the safety protocols to ensure that their detectives are not infected by this, we don't see a lot of proactive referrals coming in, but we do get referrals um, here and there. Uh, so we've had at least, um, I believe, four or five referrals with minors that we've identified here in Orange County and maybe three or four with adults. Um, the difference in the referrals coming from law enforcement is because uh, we, we do 24 seven response to our law enforcement here in Orange County. Um, what changes in the on-scene response for our victim advocates protocol has changed as well. So uh, we, do, we can still do remote services for victims. So we can deliver food um, and all those things and set them up in temporary housing, emergency housing, which is really a hotel or a motel. Those are really the only options at this point. Um, but one of the biggest things is there's a reason why we needed on-site um, response uh, uh, to the victims because there is a difference in physical presence that so you provide as a victim service provider to the victim versus screen time or telephone time or give them a telephone number to call somebody else. Um, so we have seen that effect. So during this transition period, we've only designated one staff to do on-site drop-off for emergency services on scene and we leave it to the discretion of our investigators to, to choose when that would be a safe time to have the, the advocate respond to the scene. Um, and so, so we continue to keep um, stay update with our prosecutions um, unit as well as our task force investigators um, and our other law enforcement agency to see where they are in terms of reopening um, to the public. I, I don't think it's going to reopen to the public anytime soon, even if they're able to do more proactive investigations in the upcoming couple of months. Um, Another thing I do want to point out in terms of the impact of prosecution in the court is that things that on the victim services side we have to deal with and across and including law enforcement prosecution is the zero bail that has been happening. Um, so the cases that have been investigated for the past couple months, um, we have seen our pins uh, released on zero bail. And prior to that, they were actually not, uh, very, it was very difficult for them to be able to bail out because you had to prove that the money came from illegal legitimate stores. Uh, because of the zero bail, they had to, they, they've been out. So for, on the victim services side for us, we've had to take into extra steps and precautions that we didn't have to before. Um, because of that, so in the in the in the far extreme, we've had to assist with actual physical relocation of a family, um, and then in the in the less uh, severe extreme, um, we've had to do constant contact with the victim um, and take extra safety planning for possible domestic violence or restraining orders uh, against the pimp or the trafficker. So those are just the extra steps we had to take, um, and those are only really only cases connected with criminal investigations. Um, and we and we haven't had as much as that as that when it comes to community referrals. Um, but when we're right now in ongoing conversation with our prosecution unit, uh, what's going to happen? Because there is a backlog in a lot of the court cases right now. So during the change, there were a lot of cases we had on jury trial that was uh, that was either in the middle of a jury trial or was on schedule. And so um, we are still unsure of what that's going to look like. Um, and if the courts are going to reopen, uh, it probably will not be open to the public because it's just too much uh, at this time to be able to open it all to the public. Um, but I think one of the things that we, on the victim services side, we are a little concerned about is that with, with the backlog of the cases that we're set on 
for jury trial what that is going to look like if the normal jury trial process will look the same because even if the courts were to reopen, um, I don't know if jurors would actually show up for court. I think that's also another concern too. Um, so we do have cases that, you know, I think a case for human trafficking it can be on the caseload for, for a year or more. And so for it to continue to be delayed for our victims, I think that's another thing that it does impact our victims and their mental state of mind. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of the main things that we've seen so far here in Orange County. Um, and we're responding as best as we can. I can say for sure, and similar to what everyone has said, is that um, it, it, the referrals are, it's, it's, it's gonna ebb and flow. Um, I can say for sure that in Orange County, so far in at least this year, and it's the same with every other year, that 90, 91% of our referrals have come from somebody other than the victim. So without the interaction from the community to help identify the victims, we're not gonna get victim services referral. Um, so if everybody is all shelter in place and not at the workplaces where it potentially identify victims, we could get less victim referrals down the road. Um, but luckily, actually, it, coincidentally this morning, we had a referral from the emergency room from a hospital here in Orange County uh, where the victim was contacted um, and for a possible assault. Um, but luckily in that particular case, the social worker was able to assess her further um, possibility of beyond assault and to identify as, um, possible human trafficking and then contacted us. So we are really grateful. And so we have encouraged a lot of our community partners because so much referrals come from others, somebody other than the victim to increase the training and the awareness possibility out here in the county. So that was actually a really good referral that we came this morning from the hospital. We do anticipate we should, we don't have a lot of referrals coming from the medical field or the hospital, but assaults happen and violence happens very often with sex trafficking victims. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were more referrals that would come and they're just not trained to be able to identify what they already know beyond domestic violence or child abuse yet. Right, a lot of people don't know that they are victims of human trafficking because uh, human trafficking, they, talking to people, they think that they have to be, you know, in chains to be a victim of human trafficking. So they don't know exactly what it means. So Casa de la Familia, we are gonna do a special program about what it means to be a victim of sexual trafficking or human trafficking, labor trafficking, child exploitation. We're gonna do a special uh, educational program through Facebook about that. I think that's necessary in, in all arenas. So thank you so much. Yuli mentioned about minors. Detective Gallegos mentioned about minors too. I talk about minors too. So Detective Gallegos, let's go back to you. What kind of uh, human trafficking cases of minors do you see? And then I'm going to go back to you, Lynn. I'm sorry, what was your question again? About, you, you mentioned that they were, that you were working with minors being victimized. Can you tell us what kind of victimization have you been working with, with minors? Well, uh, I can, the, our investigations, I mean, the youngest child we've had is an 11 year old, um, all the way up to a 17-year-old. A our investigations, we have the demographics on our kids. Um, I would say 60% of our kids come from um, lower income homes. Um, a lot of them are out of uh, placement. Um, a majority of them have some type of um, medical issues, whether it be bipolar or some type of uh, mental disability um narcotics abuse um that's just the their home background their 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 circumstances um a lot of our suspects um i would say probably 80 percent of our suspects are meeting and grooming our victims our our, our child victims um via multiple different types of social media uh, platforms um and then those online um, grooming uh, environments turn into physical kidnappings. Um, they turn they turn into um, coercion, where the child is coerced into meeting and coming out with our with our traffickers. And then the we have various approaches that are used by our suspects, either just straight violence on the minor to um, to submit them 
into, uh, you know, into working for them, or we have a coercion that's mixed with a sexual relationship where now the minor is involved in a sexual relationship with this adult, either male or female. Um, they then graduate into committing crimes with that uh, trafficker. And then little by little, they are then turned out onto the boulevards or even onto, um, you know, doing out calls and in calls for the sex clients, you know. So there's, there's many different uh, avenues as to which our, our suspects are, are meeting our victims, um, but usually it's via social media. Um, so I've talked about the demographics. I've talked about a little bit about how our, our traffickers are, are meeting our, our children. Um, and then we, we have multiple uh, cases where um, each trafficker has multiple different uh, um, victims that are working for them. And they're basically moving them from one county to the next. So uh, we have pretty good relationships with most of the task forces, most of the counties around here, San Bernardino County, Orange County, San Diego, LA County, uh, even Ventura and some farther up Northern California have all formed task forces because we've all realized that our, the, these children are being moved from track to track, county to county. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of trying to keep up with um, these suspects and trying to recover our minors. Thank you so much. And we do know that minors that are living in very dysfunctional families, that they are girls or boys that are being sexually exploited at home and they run away from home and they meet something even worse outside in the streets, right? Yes. So Lynn, what is your experience in Orange County? Back to you. Um, our experience, it's still, it's, still, uh, it's still happening. So we've had, it's, um, kids run away. Uh, we are actually seeing um, a couple of girls coming from family thinking that there possibly is sexual exploitation. And, and I think at this time it's also difficult for parents because they, uh, they don't know when it's sexual exploitation sexting to get the form of severe form of trafficking. And so usually with that, um, we just refer that over to uh, law enforcement, of course, with permission of the parents to do further investigation. Um, and so there are things that we do ask in terms of just sexual exploitation, sending pictures, um, things, things that we ask parents that you know, look for are, you know, um, whether it's activity, how long they've been out when they run away, um, if they've been gone for long periods of weekend, if they're coming home with extra money, or nicer things um, that they don't know where that came from. Uh, with, with the minors, for us from Orange County, for our investigators, that's still the priority. Um, so cases are still happening, um, but when there is a case where there's a minor involved, they usually jump on top of that first because of the fact uh, that it is a, a minor. Unfortunately, that's the case um, for a decision they, ha they have made as, as, as a task force. Um, and it's also very challenging and it's not an easy decision to make uh, because there's so many, human trafficking is so broad. We're talking about sex trafficking, labor trafficking, foreign victims, adults, um, and minors. And so when we have a small team of one sergeant and five investigators and including massage parlors and residents of brothels, you can't attack everything. So when you move one place, um, you, can't, you can't address the other places. And a human trafficking investigation is, is not the same as a vice investigation where you're just arresting a prostitute. These are you know, lengthy investigation that takes more time to gather evidence to be able to move forward with prosecution. So it, it's a different approach. And so you pull one resource out to, to one side or just take away from the other resource. Um, so with our minors, uh, we have been able to get special those cases. And so because our, our task force and can get investigators prioritize cases with that, we will track down the minors wherever they are across the state or um, in California, or they go across the uh, uh, to bordering uh, states and we'll figure out how to find them. And so they've gotten a little more savvy at figuring out how to go social media and locate these, these girls. Um, but we have, in terms of new case referrals that come in, we are, we are seeing that we also had, for example, another good example of increase of basic um, training, even with our patrol officers in Orange County, is preliminary investigation. So we did have a case 
in Cyprus where a car was pulled over um, and they were able to identify um, that as sex trafficking and the, and the minor was involved. And, you know, and I think uh, the detective is probably seeing this in LA County too, but working with, uh, with our social services agency in Orange County, so they are part of the lead agency here in the task force. Um, but what our challenge we had really early on, and it's still it's something that's still going on, is that um, the minors, because of their age, because of their grooming, because of their fear, they still lie about their identity and their age. And so uh, most of them actually don't have a criminal record uh, because they are kids. So when they are come across law enforcement, there's really no way to identify them um, because of that. And so we um, incorporate social services as part of the team to help make sure that we identify correctly that this is, is in fact a child, because it's not always easy to tell, uh, um, you know, at first hand that, that they are a minor. And so what we have found when we incorporated um, child and family services into the reactive or proactive team response team here for us in Orange County, that 100% of the minors that we have called social service to respond to have been part of the child welfare system. Um, that is helpful for us to know the information because most of these kids still are not from Orange County. They're from outside of Orange County. And so we have to be very careful about sending them back home because there have been prior child abuse reports in the system because of that. And without the information coming from social service, we would not be able to do the assessment and safety assessment um, and in increase the, the other things that law enforcement needs to think about in terms of investigating these cases. Um, and so I don't know if that really answers your question about okay. Yeah, of course, of course it does. We at Casa de la Familia, we also see other kind of uh, trafficking uh, with minors, which are trafficking by minors to minors. We see, for example, in high school that uh, girls and boys get together, they form relationships, and, and the, are, the girls are grooming into uh, this special relationship with this guy, and they start using drugs, and then they need money to buy drugs. So the boyfriend sells the girlfriend to somebody else to make some profit to buy to buy some more drugs. And that has something that became very popular, it's my understanding. And we have been working with uh, those kind of victims too. So for them to understand that that's uh, human trafficking, it's difficult to conceptualize, but it is because they have been coerced to go and have sex in order to produce money to buy drugs. So that's uh, one more example. So now, Rosangela, do you have other victims like that or uh, anything to add? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting exactly what the example you just gave. We, um, we do hear of, especially at the schools where um, uh, the, you know, social groups or, or friends are, are trafficking their, you know, other um, friends or introducing them to the pimps. And, um, and they, they themselves, uh, even though they're the ones that are trafficking, are, are, are the traffickers, they themselves are also victims you know, because they were also, yeah. Um, and, and we see that a lot with our, our sex trafficking survivors where a lot of them are forced to commit fry, uh, crimes um, such as trafficking others or other, um, or, or other types of crimes. And our legal services department definitely does an amazing job in trying to um, help clear those criminal backgrounds. But yeah, I mean, I, we definitely see that. We, um, with uh, with the minors, we have see. I, I do. I, you know, I know this topic is on sex trafficking, but we also do see survivors of labor trafficking. Um, so we have individuals who are not only victims of sex trafficking, but both sex and labor. Um, so we've definitely seen those cases with minors and adults. Um, yeah, very common, right? Stephanie, do you have something to add about this? Yeah, just to add, um, I was on a conversation yesterday that was um, that was conducted by a couple of doctors, one of physicians in the um, emergency rooms here in Orange County wanting to know more about labor trafficking of minors. Um, I know, again, this is about sex trafficking, but I think, um, I think it's an important topic to also um, bring up too, because I think that we, that is happening across the United States. And I think that with the way the economy is going, we don't know, we can assume that um, traffickers are going to adapt and they thrive in chaos. And so that's what that's gonna look like. And I think that, um, you know, there's with the detention centers that are happening down at the border and how COVID has even affected that, I think that we're gonna see um, 
see labor trafficking minors um, coming, you know, being identified as just learning how to identify them. So speaking with these physicians, they wanted to know from the medical standpoint, like how can we identify them in the in the emergency room? Because, you know, they they end up in the emergency room at, at one point. We all kind of, you know what I mean? That's that's the medical community does come in come in contact with victims more often than they realize. So it's learning how to create a proper assessment to identify um, minors, whether they're sex trafficking minors, which looks very, very specific, um, or, or even labor trafficking minors. And so I think that that's a, an important piece of the conversation as well. That's very true. We have some questions here. So if you want to ask questions, please write us. Uh, I'm gonna ask here a question it says, good morning. I would like to know how these victims immigration status affect the probabilities of leaving their abusers, abusers, traffickers, and if there are any special programs that help these victims to obtain a legal status in the country. And then it says, how can you identify a victim of human trafficking, and how do your organization and police departments help a victim that will not come forward because of the fear of these traffickers can harm their family? And the same person asks, a person can identify a victim by looking a change in attitude, dress, tattoo, separation, distancing from family, continue, arrest from prostitution also indicate involvement. Reach out to social workers or advocate groups to meet with the possible victim and see if she's willing to disclose. So there are multiple questions here. Um, the first of all is how to identify a victim. So maybe I will go to Detective Gallegos. How, how can the community, the open community, just anyone, identify a, a, a victim? Well, I, I think um, the easiest way is to kind of, and, and a physical transformation that you're going to see. Um, you're going to see a lot of what we see is our first contact with the young lady. Her dress may be um, very simple, maybe just spandex pants and a t-shirt. You know, and then as that transformation, as that as victim is, is getting more entrenched in the commercial sex work, you'll see that the dress starts to change. Now it's it's more provocative clothing that you'll see. You'll see either um, inappropriate um, clothing that the that the minor's wearing, uh, excessive makeup. Um, you'll now you'll start to see they'll step into the tattooing. Um, you'll see certain tattoos that w that we um, that investigators are all we are identifiers for us. You know, crowns, diamonds, uh, certain nicknames, even facial tattoos are, are are very popular. Also, so the physical indicators are the easiest things to see: dress, um, tattoos, um, the the um, the makeup, you know, just kind of on 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 the on the very on the simple um, simple identifiers, and then you'll start to see more social identifiers, and and I'm sure some of the folks from the social worker background can can chime in, but you'll you'll start to see separation from the family, you'll start to see um, erratic behavior, um, you'll start to see a lot of runaway activity where they'll be gone for days or weeks at a time, um, there'll be a change in friends. Um, there'll be a distance from, they'll be distancing themselves from the normal friends to either a, an unidentified or this person that they're hiding from the family. We, we see that a lot. Thank you, Detective Rosangela. Do you have anything to add? Maybe you can raise your hands if you want to add. Yeah. yeah? Wasn't sure <laughs> in the process, but yes. Um, yeah, I did want to add. I mean, yes, definitely what Detective Gallegos was mentioning is definitely things that we include in our HD 101 training, um, specifically with um, survivors of sex trafficking. I mean, then you hear the also, um, you know, the working the long hours, um, um, not able, you know, if someone reports um, being fearful of their employer or not being able to, um, to flee, uh, or sorry, not being able to take sick, uh, sick days or be able to leave their employment because of fear of something's gonna be done to their families back home or um, something can be done to their children, th threat of deportation. And I mean, I think overall, I think generally I tell, um, uh, when I do these HT 101 trainings is, you know, if just something doesn't feel right, call the hotline. You know, don't feel like you need, you are in a position to investigate. 
um, or try to remember this amazing virtual town hall. Okay, what did Gallego say? What did uh, Rosangela say? You know, um, I shared our cast 24 hour seven, 24 hour hotline number, um, and we get calls of, from, you know, Good Samaritans and um, folks out in the community just saying like, you know, I think this is happening in my neighborhood, but I'm not really sure that's completely okay. And, you know, don't feel like you need to have um, a very clear cut human trafficking case. If you sense that there's something not right and you feel like it might fall under that HT category, go ahead and give us a call. And, and, um, and we'll definitely help support you with that. And it can be totally anonymous. Yes, and it is anonymous. Thank you. 888-3737-888, once again. Yes? Uh, I think that was Gallego's um, hotline, but ours is one eight 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 key two free key K E Y two the number two free. Okay. And the national hotline is the eight 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 three seven three seven eight eight. That's a national human trafficking hotline. So those those calls will go directly to us service providers. Um, they have our numbers, um, and. Just as to what Rosangela has said about identifying a victim and what we teach in our 101, which I know you guys teach in your 101, um, Human Trafficking 101 too, is just the consideration of safety of the victim. Um, if we do see something that seems to, seems like it might be trafficking or it kind of makes us feel that way or whatever, um, being careful of how we address it, that's why these hotlines are available um, because we don't know who is watching the victim. We don't know if their trafficker is nearby. Um, whether it's whether we suspect labor trafficking or sex trafficking. So I think it's really, really important for the safety of the victim to um, be, be aware of, of who's around. Um, should we go talk to them or, you know, because I know that a lot of people, if they see something, they want to say something and bring attention to that individual and it could potentially put them in danger. So I would lean on the resources. CAST is a great resource. The National Hotline is a great resource. They reach out to us service providers um, if you feel like that person might be in danger once you walk away from them. The other part of this question was about immigration status. A lot of people are being coerced into sexual, sexual trafficking and they are being told that if they are not conforming, then they will be uh, deported or they will be, uh, uh, there will be a report to immigration services and this and this will happen. And it's actually the opposite. So thank you so much for the question. When somebody is a victim of human trafficking, of course, they have to be some kind of proofs about that. It's not just saying. Uh, there's a process for that, but victims are being uh, taken into account and they are being provided a temporary U visa or T visa, it depends. Usually it's a T visa and U visa usually is for domestic violence. So people that have been victimized are victims of a crime. Uh, they can uh, hire an attorney or sometimes go to Consulado Mexico, for example, and seek for legal services because the, these um, visas are exactly for those people that have been victimized. So they can help the law enforcement to prosecute uh, and uh, so they can have a temporary visa, then, then that temporary visa can turn into a, a, a definite uh, residence status. So. Uh, that shouldn't stop anyone from reporting. That shouldn't stop anyone from reporting human trafficking or domestic violence or sexual assault or nothing. Don't be uh, afraid of reporting. Reporting will help you. That's very important. Okay, there was uh, something, uh, other questions here. Let's see. Um, I, I got here the phone numbers for CAS, but you just told them that's perfect. Uh, leaving the abusers. Well, I just respond to that, right? About the, the immigration status. Okay, so we will share the entire recordings of this webinar with all. So we're gonna have it on Facebook so anyone, anyone can see it. So we can all go back to that. And as soon as we finish this, I'm gonna do a synopsis of whatever we were talking in Spanish. So if any of you presenters speak Spanish, uh, you can stay with me. If not, I'm going to just give a synthesis, a summary of what we're talking here in Spanish. So it can be good information for everyone. We want to let you know that at Casa de la Familia, we provide mental health services and we work collaboratively with all of these agencies and other ones too. Uh, the mental health services that we have are for the victims and their families. We have a grant from the uh, Victims of Crime Office 
and the, thanks to them we are able to provide the services and we are very committed with the community in terms of providing trainings and talking on, on Facebook about what is going on in the community. So if there is any issue that you want to relate to us, please give us a call. Michelle, do you have anything to add? Yes, I was actually going to add and kind of go a little bit further on what you were saying, which is with this new grant through the um, through OVC, um, starting in January, it is a three-year grant. Uh, anyone who has been a victim and their families, like you said, of human trafficking, please call us. Um, there are no cost services. We are, of course, doing virtual uh, telehealth right now. We have over 40 therapists on staff that are all um, uh, bilingual and you know, Casa de la Familia has always been committed to assisting those, especially in a very cu culturally sensitive, I would say, as well as being bilingual, not just being bilingual, but also culturally sensitive, especially to the Latino community. Um, I know, Doctor, when you, when you formed Casa de la Familia, there were very, very few resources for the Latino community in the way of mental health. So to bring about this awareness, um, of course, things have changed during this time. So telehealth is one of them, as many of you are now doing. Um, we still will continue with webinars, with um, services, even via FaceTime, in Spanish as well as in English. And please look at our Casa de la Familia website. It does change. We anticipate even uh, having our 40-hour domestic violence training, which is a separate sect, I know. But it will touch upon some human trafficking um, education is in that one, and that will be virtual coming up in about a month or so. But please contact us for any needs, as we would love to hear from you and your organizations and how you know what you are doing so that we can relay them to our case managers since we work in mental health. We're not a shelter um, uh, or provide other types of services that you might. So we would love to hear from you so that we can pass that on to our clients. Thank you. I'm glad you have attended and please stay on for um, some more education that Dr. Nogales might give you in Spanish. But if you need to leave the meeting at this time, uh, thank you for coming together with us. We really, truly appreciate it. And to all of our esteemed panelists. Thank you, all of the panelists. Thank you so much. This concludes the English version of the human trafficking uh, at the pandemic time. Y a nuestros presentadores, si hablan en español, pues los invito a que se queden con nosotros. Eh, me gustaría hacer una síntesis de lo que hemos hablado en el día de hoy. Uh, yo sé que Rosángela nos puede acompañar, que habla bien español. No sé el resto, no sé si el detective Gallegos habla español. ¿Sí? ¿No? <risa> ¿Habla usted español? ¿Do you speak Spanish? <risa> ¿Ah? Sí, me puedo defender ¿Sí? un poquito. Ah, bueno, fantástico, fantástico. Pero, pero ¿sabe qué, doctora? Me tengo que ir, me perdona oh. esta vez. Bueno, si se puede quedar, qué bueno, y si se tiene que ir, lo disculpamos. Ok, bueno, gracias, <risa> tenga, tenga buen día. Gracias, gracias, muchas gracias. Uh -huh. uh, Stephanie, ¿do you speak Spanish? No? Ok, I'm so sorry, I'll leave you down. Ok, so thank you so much, thank you so much. Bueno, estábamos hablando eh, acerca de human trafficking en este momento de, de la pandemia porque uno primero diría qué pasó aquí, ¿no es cierto? ¿Qué está pasando? Me imagino que ya no va a haber eh, explotación sexual porque la pandemia y los riesgos de contagio y la gente va a tener miedo. Y sin embargo estamos viendo eh, a través de todo lo que se ha hablado en, en este town hall de que los riesgos siguen estando ahí, que la prostitución sigue estando sumamente activa y que en formas distintas quizás, y que la explotación de los traficantes sigue existiendo. Y esto se va basando en, en, en patrones de, que, que se dan naturalmente, ¿no es cierto? Muchas de las personas que se dedican a, a, a la prostitución han cambiado su forma de, de trabajo a nivel virtual, lo hacen eh, a través de los medios sociales, mostrándose con películas, con lo que sea, pero para hacer eso se necesita dinero y no todos tienen ese acceso al dinero para poder continuar con este tipo de, 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 de trabajo. Entonces vuelven a los traficantes para que los traficantes les consigan trabajo o les den dinero de alguna forma. Y esto los expone a un tráfico, a una trata, a una explotación sexual mayor. 
porque como hay menos demanda, todavía la hay, pero hay menos demanda en cierta forma, eso hace que eh, se, los explotadores cobren menos para poder mantener su clientela y esto es, esta clientela, los que lo llaman los Johnnies, hacen que la gente tome mucho más riesgos de los comunes, o sea que los forzan a hacer cosas mucho más eh, arriesgadas en cuestiones de prácticas sexuales. Sabemos que hay muchos adictos sexuales que no van a dejar de consumir porque no pueden dejar de consumir porque es parte de su ansiedad, parte de su adicción y lo van a seguir haciendo. Hay otras personas que no tienen la menor idea de lo que realmente está ocurriendo o que son negadores de lo que está ocurriendo en una pandemia y por ello entonces hacen como que nada existe y siguen, siguen consumiendo de la misma forma sin tener ningún tipo de responsabilidad al respecto. Y la gente que se siente en este momento que no le queda más que trabajar o morirse de hambre y lo único que pueden hacer porque no tienen la educación, porque no saben cómo hacerlo, porque no tienen documentos, porque están, han sido traumados toda su vida, eh, gente que está con adicciones, ellos mismos, hacen que sean mucho más vulnerables todavía a la trata de personas, a este tipo de trata en, cu en cuestión a la explotación sexual. Entonces estábamos viendo que en el departamento de CAS, que eh, Rosángela eh, nos puede hablar enseguida, ha habido menos eh, llamadas de teléfono, pero hay una explicación al respecto. Y Lintran en Orange County nos estaba diciendo que sí, que al principio hubo menos, pero ahora que ya están aumentando los reportes de tráfico. Y estamos hablando de explotación no solamente de adultos, sino también de menores, de los que me voy a referir ahora. Pero como Rosángela Rodríguez de CAS, ella habla muy bien español, ella nos puede decir lo, lo que está ocurriendo en Los Ángeles. Así que te paso el micrófono a ti, Rosángela. Gracias, doctora Nogales. Um, so, como le estaba comentando antes, um, eh, 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 sí hemos visto un, un 50% menos de llamadas um, a, a nuestra agencia para ayuda para uh, humano, uh, uh, personas víctimas de, de traficando de humanos. Um, Puede ser por, por varias razones, pero um, y, y para hablar, nosotros no somos, uh, no trabajamos, no somos de, de, de la policía, somos una un organización que da ayuda, um, damos servicios sociales, um, servicios legales. So puede ser que ciertos sitios como estaciones de policías o detectivos pueden ver más casos, nosotros no estamos haciendo investigaciones. So puede ser que para nuestras razones, para, porque hay menos números, es, um, hay uh, un miedo de, tra de tratar de pedir ayuda um, por el riesgo de salud, um, el riesgo que van a tener que salir de la casa o donde están uh, ahorita um, uh, donde están uh, los, tra los, trafica uh, los que le están traficando, le están um, uh, amenazando, diciendo que you know, si, si usted sale, um, esto te puede pasar, puedes morir, puedes, um, te van a llevar la policía. Cosas que hemos escuchado antes, especialmente cuando estaba pasando todo con, con los centros de detenciones y, y el... el um, Uh, lo, los, las situaciones de la inmigración después que de la última elección había mucho en, en las noticias sobre um, qué puede pasar a las personas si ellos piden ayuda. Puede ser similar así, estamos pasando por un crisis y un crisis es, es algo para la el, para el persona que está trafic, uh, traficando a personas es una oportunidad grande para ellos porque pueden tratar de... Um, darles más uh, miedo a las personas y pues, las personas pueden tener más miedo porque están dando los mensajes que algo le puede pasar a ellos si tratan de, de salir de, de donde están o pedir ayuda. So, eso es lo que asumimos, pero obviamente um, para las personas que están aquí, los, los participantes, si en cualquier situación están um, viendo algo o, o han visto, o escuchado algo, um, Definitivamente la doctora Nogales puede dar uh, o, o Gabriela puede dar los números de teléfonos para, para llamar y, y preguntar si uh, hay un tipo de ayuda para una persona que posiblemente uh, está siendo traficada. 
Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Rosángela. Y en Orange County, el Intra nos ha hablado de que el primer mes han tenido pocos referrals, y me imagino que era por todo este miedo de la gente que estaba recién hablando a Rosángela, pero que luego los números aumentaron, eh, aumentaron bastante en el mes de abril y aún ahora en mayo. Eh, todo esto tiene su lógica, la gente ha tenido mucho miedo, miedo de decir algo, miedo de ser arrestada, eh, la gente indocumentada, que muchas, muchas de las víctimas son gente indocumentada, que están siendo presionada para hacer ciertas cosas porque están indocumentados, o le dice que por no estar documentados, entonces tienen que obedecer, eh, y por eso tienen mucho más miedo todavía de llamar y pedir ayuda. Por favor, sepan que las personas indocumentadas tienen el mismo acceso a pedir ayuda que cualquier otra. Y que también hay albergues que, aunque muchos estén llenos y estén ahora protegidos por lo de la pandemia, también hay recursos que se ha, que ha dado el gobierno donde se puede poner a las personas en un hotel temporariamente para rescatarlas. Muchas personas piensan también que no hay que pedir ayuda en este momento porque eh, la policía o, o el gobierno no está dando servicios. Sin embargo, sí se están dando los servicios de emergencia, sí se están dando. Estamos, eh, bueno, estamos, yo no soy parte de, de, de la, del departamento de policía, pero sé perfectamente bien, porque el detective Gallegos nos estuvo hablando también, y Lintran también, que eh, los servicios de, están siendo efectivos para casos de emergencia. Así que sí, si uno llama, sí va a tener los recursos necesarios. Además, una buena pregunta que alguien hizo ahí es de que el miedo a la inmigración, ¿no? El miedo que venga inmigración y se lo lleve a uno si uno hace un reporte. Y justamente la persona que ha sido traficada, la persona que es víctima de un crimen, ya sea trata de personas, porque human trafficking en español no es tráfico humano, porque eso implicaría el tráfico de la gente por un coyote, no nos referimos a eso, estamos hablando de trata de personas, lo que antiguamente le decíamos trata de blancas, que ahora no es blanca, sino blancas, negras, rojas y amarillas de cualquier color, la trata de personas, mujeres y hombres también, que son víctimas de trata, eh, cuando uno hace el reporte a las autoridades, puede luego calificar para una visa T, o eh, a las personas en violencia doméstica, una visa U o BAWA. O sea, es importante hacer el, el reporte una vez que una persona hace el reporte, está protegida por la ley y puede recibir eh, la visa temporaria y luego la residencia, más tarde la residencia permanente. Así que es importante estar informados y no dejarse amenazar así simplemente porque alguien venga y diga, tienes que hacer esto porque si no te va a pasar esto otro. Tienen que siempre informarse ante cualquier amenaza de si eso es cierto o no es cierto. Lo más probable es que cuando haya una amenaza es que no sea cierta esa amenaza. Bien, luego estuvimos hablando acerca de, eh, oh, el, detective, el detective Gallegos nos dijo algo muy importante, de que hay un aumento de tráfico. De, de personas en explotación sexual en los bulevares, principalmente el bulevar de Figueroa. Y también dijo en eh, San Fernando, ¿no? En San Fernando Valley, que donde están trabajando muy activamente, dijo que algunas personas creen que por cambiar de un condado al otro no va a haber efectivización de los servicios, y él aclaró muy bien que se trata ya de... de, de de varias coaliciones trabajando juntos para efectivizar de, el procesamiento legal, que si se muda una persona, se cambia una persona de un, de un condado a otro, como lo hacen regularmente, igual van a ser identificados por, el, por la policía o por los recursos que tenemos en la actualidad. A ver, ¿qué más tenemos por aquí? Porque yo estuve tomando mis notas para contarles a todos ustedes de lo que estaba pasando. Uh, respecto a menores. Rosángela. Cuéntate un poquito de los menores y yo le agrego. Sí, um, so si nosotros en CAS sí tenemos um, un programa que um, vemos personas de, um, de, que son menores y lo que hemos, um, nuestra experiencia con personas que, que, um, uh, que están en nuestro programa que son menores, um, uh, se puede ver que y que creo que doctora Nogales lo dijo muy perfecto en que nosotros escuchamos mucho en, en las noticias como un ejemplo de que es alguien que sufre de este, esta situación, como alguien que está en, um, que, que, que viene de otro país o que está en, ¿cómo se dijo? Chains. Encadenado. Encadenado y, 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 y honestamente no es... Uh, um, 
muchos de nuestros, um, nuestros menores fue, fueron, tra, um, entraron a esta situación, uh, fueron, tra, perdón, usted me dijo que no se dice tráfico, no eso quería ser, pero trata, uh, trata de, de humanos um, de, en las escuelas. So, tenemos uh, menores que, vamos a decir, que, you know, co como cualquier otro joven, tienen amigos, quieren, quieren um, hacer cosas que sus otros amigos o amigas hacen y uh, quieren ser parte de, de un grupo. Y, uh, y desafortunadamente, uh, algunos de esos jóvenes um, usan esa oportunidad en tratar de um, uh, que, que estas personas conozcan um, a, a la a, a un adulto que va a tomar a ventaja de ellos en, en tratar que ellos um, les esfuercen en la prostitución o les esfuercen a hacer cosas, um, um, uh, uh, actas uh, de sexuales. Um, y muchos de estos jóvenes desafortunadamente han tenido una historia de abuso o um, traumas en sus vidas y encuentran este grupo en la escuela o esta, este adulto que le está tomando ventaja. Ellos saben eso y manipulan um, a, a estos jóvenes porque saben que esto, you know, ellos están teniendo problemas en su casa. Um, también hemos visto en um, las... Um, eh, con familias de foster care, um, en, en casas de donde hay foster care, donde hay diferentes jóvenes y también los padres, desafortunadamente, que son los, los foster care parents, um, están traficando igualmente a los, a los menores de edad. So, um, so sí hemos, vi, hemos visto y um, como la doctora Nogales ha, ha, ha mencionado, um, hay recursos para estas personas si se quieren... Um, Uh, salir de esa situación. Hay, hay um, ayudas legales como la, la visa T. Um, hay uh, uh, refugios para, para personas si no saben dónde ir y necesitan um, huir de, de esta situación. So, definitivamente, definitivamente hay recursos y hay esperanza para estas personas, pero no más es estos, estos tipos de... de, de um, Uh, webinars o estos tipos de lo que estamos haciendo ahorita, la gente no más tiene que estar educada en lo que es este, este problema y, y cuando ve algo y, y, y se recuerda de, es, de esta sesión hoy, saben que, ok, tenemos que llamar a un a, a hotline o un número para ver y you know, tratar de ayudar a esa persona. El número nacional para reportar si usted tiene alguna duda. No hace falta que usted reporte lo que está pasando. Usted no tiene que investigar nada. Si usted tiene dudas, el número nacional es el 888-3737-888. Lo vamos a poner en pantalla aquí también. Rosángela, ¿quieres dar el número de ustedes? Sí, nuestro, nuestro hotline, um, que es para personas en, en el condado de Los Ángeles, es 888-539-539. 2373. Uh, otra vez, 888-539-2373. Cualquier pregunta, no tiene que ser alguien que está huyendo de, de, de esa situación. Si tienen preguntas de nuestros um, servicios o si usted um, piensa que hay algo así pasando en su comunidad, um, puede llamar a nuestro número también igual como el otro número que dio la doctora Nogales, y hablar con alguien. Um, y nuestro número, alguien siempre está contestando 24 horas al día. Acá está poniendo Gabriela en pantalla que para mandar un texto, si quiere mandar un texto a la línea nacional, el texto para mandar un texto es el 233733. Nuevamente, 233733. El teléfono de casa de la familia, 213-413. 7777. Yo sé que son muchísimos teléfonos, pero en caso de emergencia, ustedes que ven una emergencia, ¿a dónde llamar? 911 y ya. Ya ellos se encargarán de, de mandarle eh, el mensaje a quien sea necesario. Otro tema del que se habló que es muy importante es la, la explotación de menores, es lo que estábamos hablando ahora. 
Y esto es muy importante porque hay muchos menores explotados sexualmente que ni saben que los están, explot que los están explotando. Y el caso típico que no hemos visto en Casa de la Familia es el de la niña adolescente que se enamora de este magnífico muchacho y que empiezan a tener sexo y tienen, empiezan a usar drogas y para consumir dro drogas se necesita dinero. Entonces, él la convence a ella para que tenga sexo con gente, con hombres, con, con hombres que, de la calle. Entonces, así trae dinero y pueden los dos usar ese dinero para beneficiarse, supuestamente, ¿no es cierto? Y así es como comienza también, es una forma de coerción. Y mucha gente no sabe que eso es victimización y que eso es trata, que eso es human trafficking, sí lo es. Todo lo que sea coerción se tiene que ver con la trata, con, cuando una persona es intimidada, cuando una persona no tiene más salida que hacer esto, cuando está eh, amenazada. ¿No es cierto? No necesariamente tienen que estar con cadenas, como decía recién Rosángela, sino amenazados de esta forma. Entonces son víctimas de, de trata. Y a veces a, hasta los menores son vendidos por sus propios padres o tíos o gente que, que está a cargo de ellos, a lo mejor para pagar una deuda que tienen. Eh, lamentablemente esto también es una realidad. Así que hay muchas formas de explotación sexual. La más común es a través de los medios sociales. Eh, no es muy difícil que en los medios sociales los menores sean engañados. Porque cualquier persona puede poner una foto, eh, yo puedo poner una foto de ser eh, Miss Universo y puedo ser una traficante. Los traficantes no solamente son hombres, muchas veces son mujeres también, porque es más fácil en, eh, para una mujer engañar a un menor que para un hombre. Entonces, como, los, como lo hacen a veces es que le hacen sacar fotos, se le dicen, uy, qué lindo que está, qué hermoso, qué... Por ejemplo, un muchacho, ¿no es cierto? Eh, a una chica todavía es más fácil decirle qué bonita que estás o qué, qué, qué músculos hermosos. A ver, muéstrame esto, muéstrame lo otro y poco a poco le van sacando eh, más fotos y después los hacen víctimas de extorsión y los hacen víctimas de pornografía infantil. Eso es otra de las formas. Hay miles de formas de extorsión, así que hay que tener mucho cuidado con los medios sociales, con el internet, con Facebook y con todas estas nuevas formas de comunicación social que ahora los menores están mucho más expuestos porque están en casa todo el tiempo y hasta tienen la escuela a través de la, de, de la computadora. Así que están mucho más expuestos que nunca en otro momento. Como dijo el detective eh, Gallegos, nos contó de que el, eh, ellos están trabajando eh, más que nada con adolescentes entre los 11 y los 17, 18 años, que son la, las víctimas más comunes con las que están operando. El 60% en, en, en hogares, vienen de hogares de escasos recursos. Eh, muchos se, se han ido de la casa, así que no tienen dónde vivir y son los que están más expuestos a la trata. Algunos de ellos tienen problemas psiquiátricos, esquizofrenia, escuchan voces, problemas de bipolaridad. Eh, otros usan narcóticos y de nuestra experiencia personal, muchas de estas víctimas han sido victimizadas en la casa por sus propios padres, eh, víctimas de incesto, se están escapando de la violencia del hogar y encuentran más violencia en la calle todavía. Estas son las, las cosas más comunes que, que estamos viendo desafortunadamente en nuestra civilización. Civilización del mundo, porque no es solamente que ocurre acá en los Estados Unidos, ocurre en todos lados, en frontera, tenemos, eh, sabemos poco de la victimización que está ocurriendo porque la gente no se anima a reportar, porque reportar los expone todavía a más violencia, porque no hay mucha eh, eh, prosecución, no se dice prosecución, no, no hay mucha ejecución de las autoridades o de las leyes legales, por decirlo así. En, en, en algunos puntos eh, sabemos que las, los traficantes tienen carta blanca como para hacer lo que quieran o casi lo que quieran todavía. Eh, si esto no es así, ojalá no fuera así, pero es lo que me han dicho a mí, lo que me han reportado a mí cuando hice mis propias entrevistas allí en Tijuana. Esto aqueja a todo el mundo, no es solamente Estados Unidos, no son no solamente nuestros países limítrofes, sino en todo el mundo. Y con la pandemia, lamentablemente, la gente está más expuesta a la explotación a todo nivel. No solamente de explotación sexual, sino también de explotación laboral, a lo que también eh, tenemos que darle eh, nuestro, eh, nuestros recursos y, y proveer información. Para todo ello, CAST, 
representado hoy por Rosángela Rodríguez, eh, Lintran en el Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force, en Salvation Army también con, eh, no me quiero equivocar en los nombres, eh, Stephanie, Taylor, Stephanie Taylor, también tenemos, hoy presentó también otra organización eh, con Wendy Daly, que es una organización que se dedica a, a se llama International Sanctuary, y que dan servicios de entrenar a la gente para que tenga recursos, para que puedan tener un trabajo, para que puedan defenderse en sus propias vidas y no volver al traficante porque se están ahogando en, en la pobreza. Todos estos recursos y muchísimos más hay para sobrevivientes de, tra de trata. Vamos a hacer la semana que viene eh, una, eh, una exposición informativa acerca de trata de personas, la vamos a hacer una hora en inglés y una hora en español a través de Casa de la Familia, así que los invito a todos ustedes que estén atentos porque las presentaciones van a continuar. Cuantos más informados estamos, más, más podemos hacer por nuestra sociedad. Y nuevamente es la responsabilidad de todos nosotros, de ustedes también, de todos nosotros, de reportar si vemos algo. No hagan ustedes su propia investigación. Si ven algo dudoso, reporten, lo pueden hacer anónimamente al 888-3737-888. Gracias al programa de la Oficina de Violencia, Office Violence, uh, Office, OBC, Office of Violence Against Crime, no, ¿cómo es? Office, Michelle, no te escucho, estás en mute. Office of Victims of Crime. Office of Victims of Crime, de la Oficina de Víctimas de Crimen, ahí está. Este, que nos ha dado la posibilidad a través de un grant de poder dar estos servicios de salud mental a toda nuestra comunidad, en inglés, en español, y estamos pendientes de todos ustedes por lo que necesitan. Para comunicarse con Casa de la Familia, háganlo a través de nuestro website, llámenos por teléfono, escríbanos, aquí estamos para ayudarles. Muchas gracias, Rosángela, por compartir este tiempo extra con Casa de la Familia, conmigo. Muchas gracias, Michelle, por coordinar todo esto. Muchas gracias, Gabriela González. Por la, por la asistencia técnica que siempre nos has brindado. Y gracias a todos nuestros terapistas por estar siempre ahí pendientes de nuestra comunidad para darles una mano. Con esto concluye nuestra presentación. Nos vemos nuevamente la próxima semana.